Hallo, ich heiße Herr Davidson. No? Oh, lo siento. Disculpe. Me llamo Señor Davidson y mi esposa es Señora Davidson. Entien? Entendés? No? Sorry. You guys want me to speak to you in English because you understand and speak English. Have you ever wondered why there are so many languages? That there are so many different languages in the world where you can travel to different areas and you can find and hear and listen to languages that you do not understand. And yet for the people in those countries, they are able to completely and utterly understand each other. But when we're talking in English, they have no clue what we're saying. They don't understand. Well, we're coming into the part of the Bible, to the story in Scripture where we see the languages divided, where we come to the point where God creates all of these various languages, and we see that it's in a response to people and what they were doing, and it is God judging them. We come to the story of the Tower of Babel. So go ahead and take your Bibles that you've got there in front of you. Let's open them up to Genesis chapter 11. And we're going to learn about the origin of language. And we're going to seek to understand what God is seeking to teach us. Jaron, could you turn me down just a skosh? I feel like I'm echoing back in my face. Let's see. That should be a little bit better. Less echoey for me is probably better for you. Genesis chapter 11. And we're going to start in verse 1 and read down to verse 9. So let's get those Bibles open. Let's get our eyes on the Word of God. And let's follow along as I read out loud. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And, and they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So we see these people after Noah and the flood, the earth is being repopulated by the descendants of Noah. And these group of people, they gather together and they want to make a name for themselves. They're like, we want to build our city and our tower. and We're going to reach all the way to the heavens. We are going to be people that are known. We're going to build a name for ourselves. And then we see in verse 5, God comes down to see this city. And the picture is almost like God, he grabs like a microscope and he stoops down to try and see what it is, this little tiny thing that they're bidding, building. Because God is infinite. And they're thinking, we're going to be as big as God. And God's like, I got to get a microscope out to try and spot your little thing that you're trying to build for yourselves. We see that God holds this almost in derision, that it's a mocking thing, that you think you can make yourselves a name on par with mine. I can barely see what you have accomplished. It is as a nothing in the eyes of God. And they want to make a name for themselves. So they're known as Babel, confusion. They don't make a great name of pride for themselves. They're like, look at what we've done. We've become confusion. 
Nobody's really trying to stick that on there. I'm confusion. I'm confused. Like that's not a, a positive thing that we see that God reacts to that and he creates he disperses them by their languages where suddenly they can no longer communicate or understand each other and so they disperse they do what God has called them to do which is to disperse and to fill the earth and instead of sitting there and building this one city trying to make a name for themselves God disperses them But what is it that God ultimately is opposing here in this passage? What is it that causes God to go down and say, "Uh uh-uh, this is going to stop. I'm going to confuse your language and disperse you. Well, what we see is that the whole idea, their whole project, it's built on making a name for ourselves. And we can sum that idea up in a single word, pride. That what it is that God ultimately is opposing here at the Tower of Babel, it's pride. That instead of worshiping God, bringing God the glory, honoring God as we are meant to do, instead they're trying to honor themselves. They are trying to build up their own names. They're trying to make a name for themselves instead of bringing God the glory, giving God the honor, God, the only one who is worthy of all glory and honor and praise. They're trying to steal that for themselves. And God says, no, we're going to stop you right there. We're going to end this whole set of foolishness. And so God disperses them via their languages. If you look in James 4, 6, this is what God says about the proud. He says, it gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We don't want to be on that first side of that sentence. You do not want to have the eternal creator of all things, omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, all everywhere present at all times. You don't want him standing against you. Like, if he's your opponent in anything, you will lose. That is a bad place to be. That is a place of fear and trembling. You do not want to be the proud. This is where the people of Babel were. And oftentimes we can be proud ourselves. And this is what it says. God opposes the proud. And so if we don't want to find ourselves standing before God with him opposing us, Because none of us want that. We know that that's a bad thing, and we yet don't fully comprehend how terrible a thing it is to have God opposing us. So if we don't want to find ourselves on the opposite side of God, we need to humble ourselves. So humble yourself before God humbles you. Humble yourself before God humbles you. That's the big idea. Our one big main focus of this passage is humble yourself before God humbles you. You will be humbled, either willingly or unwillingly. You will be humble. You will either be standing in fear and trembling before a holy and awesome God who is opposing you, Or you will willingly submit to him as Lord and Savior and find that he promises grace to those who are humble. God rejects the pride of the people of Babel and disperses them and leaves their attempt at building a name for themselves in mockery and derision. Being mocked by the people. It's a word of warning. It's not a positive thing they're remembered for, but a concern, a warning. Don't be like those people. That's the name they made for themselves. So the question is, how then do we humble ourselves? What does it mean to be humble before God? I love the way that C.S. Lewis puts this, and he attributes it to someone else, but I know it from him, so I'll let him attribute it. But he says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, as in just this self-deprecating, I'm going to make fun of myself and think I have no worth, but it's thinking of yourself less. That your mind is not often and always focused on you. The question is, whom are you focused on? Our natural tendency is self. We, We are doing that from the day we are born. 
Babies are crying because they are hungry or sad or need their diaper changed. Their whole focus as infants is on themselves. If you see the toddlers in the toddler room, they don't need to be taught to look out for themselves. They're having to learn how to share their toys. That we are proud and selfish from the day we are born. We need to learn how to think of others more than ourselves. The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And a second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That second greatest commandment is the call to love others as much as we love ourselves. We are trained, we have taught, we know how to love ourselves. We need to learn, we need to be taught, we need to be trained, we need to work at loving others well. I think that the biggest question comes down to, do we think of others as more significant than ourselves? Do we consider others before ourselves? And are we focused on God's desires, God's wants, God's will, or are we focused on our own? We even saw in the catechism that you guys are learning and studying how can we glorify God by loving him and by obeying his commandments and law. That we are to obey his commands and his law. That that's the call. That's what we're supposed to do. That we're to humble ourselves, submit to God as Lord, as God, and do what he says. And we are to consider others as more significant than ourselves. Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, humble, in being humble, consider or count others more significant than yourselves. How can you be humble before God? You think other people are more important than you. That your focus is on them. Let each of you, all of us in this room, let each of us look not only to our own interests, because we do that naturally, okay? You look for your own interests all the time. The game that you want to play, the food that you want to eat, the activities you want to spend time in. You naturally are looking out and choosing and desiring those things. But what you need to do is look also to the interest of others. You need to humble yourselves. You need to count others as more important than yourself. You need to look to their interests, their desires, their wants more than your own. You need to humble yourselves. Your parents you need to submit to as your authorities. You need to count your siblings' desires as more important than your own. You need to love them, to seek their interest, to consider them worthy of enjoying good things. That your classmates you need to be humble with. Your teachers you need to submit to as authorities. You need to be obedient to them, listening to them. Because they are in authority over you and you need to be humble before them. You need to humble yourselves. Because here's the thing, you need to humble yourself before God humbles you. You will become humble. You will be humbled. But you will be humbled either by yourself willingly submitting to God as Lord and Savior. Or you will be humbled when God gets glory over you. In Exodus 14, 4, we read this about Pharaoh. God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. This is into the Red Sea. As Pharaoh is pursuing the people into the Red Sea. This is what God says. I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. You see, Pharaoh and his host, they rejected God. They hardened their hearts before God. They did not obey God. When God said, let my people go, they said, no. I will not let your people go. And when they finally come to their last straw after the 10th plague and they usher the people of Israel out, like, get out of here. We don't want to see you anymore. As soon as they're gone, they're like, wait. No, no, we want them back. 
And so they gather their army and they pursue them. They harden their hearts even then and they pursue them. And what happens? They follow them into the Red Sea and the Red Sea comes over them and wipes them out. And God is glorified. God gets his glory. God will be glorified. But he will be glorified in either your humility before him in loving him and serving him and following him and obeying him. Or he will be glorified when you are humiliated before him. When he gets his glory over Pharaoh. You see, we are called to humble ourselves or God will make us humble. Pharaoh learned humility in the end as his chariot was washed away in the Red Sea. That's not a great time to learn humility. The time to learn humility is before. The time to learn humility is now. It's not later. It's not down the road. It's not when you get older. The time to learn humility is today. It was yesterday, but now it's today. Yesterday's gone, so today's the best you got. The time to learn humility is now. Third, fourth, fifth grade, this is the time to learn to be humble. Do not think that you can wait until you get older. You will be hardened in your heart. It will be harder to become humble as you get older. Learn it now. Learn to count others more significant than yourself today. Learn to submit and obey the Lord today. Learn to follow him today. Because God will get his glory. God is the only one worthy of glory. And when we are proud, we're saying, no, 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 I need some of that glory. Give me some of what belongs to you, God. Share it with me. I'm worthy of it. We are not. We are not worthy of the glory that is belonging to God alone. All glory and honor and praise belongs to God and to God alone. When we are proud, we're trying to steal what is only belonging to God. And so we must humble ourselves. We can choose to glorify God now. We can glorify God with our lives today. We can give God the glory that he deserves willingly and joyfully and find that God gives grace to the humble. That the good life is found in giving God glory. That joy is found in giving God the glory. Because God alone is worthy of it. It is the way you were made. You were made to glorify God. You were made in his image to bring him glory. That is what your purpose is. So do so willingly, joyfully, because it's good and right. Because if you harden yourselves, if you harden your hearts today... If you say, no, I'm going to seek what I want. I'm going to do the things I want. I'm going to look out only for my interests. There will come a day when God will get his glory from you. But it will be like Pharaoh. It won't be a good thing for you. It will be good in that God does good things. As God is glorified, it is good and right. And he is glorified even in his judgment. God is glorified in his judgment on the Tower of Babel. But we want to willingly give God the glory. We want to willingly show God the glory that he alone deserves. Because you see, even in the people's sin here in Babel, God gets glory. God gets glory in his story as we see these people judged as God causing their confusion as God disperses them over the earth, God gets his glory then. But we see even in the profusion of languages, as all these languages are brought in the Deutsch, the Espanol, and English, and in all the other languages that are created, we see that God gets glory in all of them too. That in creating these languages as a judgment against the people of Babel, God will then use that to bring himself glory. And we see that in Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11. 
It says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and every tongue. That word there t- translated tongue, it means language. Every single language, all of the languages that God creates at Babel, God is going to use those languages and all of them to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That even in his judgment all the way back at the Tower of Babel, in dispersing the people in judgment against them by confusing their languages, and we see that even today with all the confusion of languages, we go forward and we see that at the end of days, God will be glorified by all of those languages as everyone in every single language confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That even in his judgment at the Tower of Babel, God is bringing himself glory by judging them and then bringing all of those languages to bring him glory. We can willingly join in that chorus of that day by humbling ourselves now. Or we can join in that chorus unwillingly to the glory of God and his just judgment when we harden ourselves and reject him. So the question is, will you humble yourself? Or will you, in stubborn pride and arrogance, allow God to oppose you? That he will be gloried by his glory over you. Will you give him the glory willingly? Or will he take it from you in judgment? I pray that you choose to humble yourselves and to do so today. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the truth of your word. God, and even just seeing how you have brought glory out of the judgment against these people, that they were sinful and proud and arrogant, and you opposed them and dispersed them, God. But in your dispersion of them through the creation of languages, God, that one day all of those languages will join together in a beautiful, harmonious chorus of praise to you. And you will be glorified on that day. God, may we willingly humble ourselves before you. May we not harden our hearts in arrogant pride that we would be opposed. But may we humble ourselves to bring you glory. Glory that only you deserve. God, I pray that each of these students would humble themselves today before you, submit to you as Lord and as Savior, offer their lives to you, serve you and your desires, seek to serve others, to look for the interests of others, to consider others as more significant than themselves, trusting in you, God, that you give grace to the humble. God, if we want to be in a good place before you, it is found in humility before you. So God, may you be glorified in us as we humbly submit to you. And I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.